Hare Krishna, Priyavrata here again, and uh, I have my Gita with me. Today I wanted to actually start with <clears throat> where it all started. It's a good start, isn't it? Uh, actually, there is a little story I have, which um, I have told a few devotees, which to me is very precious. <clears throat> and it's really about the the introduction to the Bhagavad Gita, as it is, by Srila Prabhupada, Isi Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. And um, correct me if there is any error in this story, but this is what I heard and I read in the Prabhupada Lila Amrita. That uh, when Prabhupada came to New York City, he uh, stayed first there with this uh, Dr. Mishra, uh, this yoga teacher. and. Then later he rented uh, or borrowed whatever, some kind of um, room or apartment or whatever in the in some skyscraper there in, in Manhattan as far as I understand. And he wanted to give lectures there so he uh, I think he put made little posters or whatever and uh, advertised that. Uh, lectures, I don't know, maybe Prasadam or whatever. Uh, someone definitely knows better about this. It would, would be interesting to know about this um, episode, this part of his uh, work. And uh, and then he invited people to come for, a, I guess, a Bhagavad Gita lecture. So uh, I guess he did a lot of preparations for that and as the time approached for that lecture he sat there waiting for the um, audience and nobody came. Now in retrospect that some of us had a similar experience. Um, so uh, he then remembered this is what he told his disciples, as far as I heard, that his Guru Maharaj, Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati, had told him that, you know, you just go to the West and you, you know, spread this message of the Bhagavad Gita. And if, if nobody comes uh, to listen, then you just speak to the walls. The walls will listen. Uh, which is a pretty interesting, you know, statement. So he remembered that and he just gave a lecture to the walls. Uh, but um, he had borrowed a tape recorder from someone and this is something I recently understood about Srila Prabhupada that he had, uh, just like some one disciple I read uh, or I actually heard yeah, a video on YouTube uh, where he said the first time he, because Prabhupada was typing his books on a typewriter, one key, you know, you only use basically the index finger, so it would take very long time. So then one uh, young guy, but then he found in a shop a dictaphone, a Grundig dictaphone, I think it was, and had no idea how to use it, but he bought it for Prabhupada, thinking this would be good because. The guy in the shop told him that it could be used, would normally be used by lawyers and doctors, you know, to speak things that would be later transcribed. And he thought this is perfect. He bought it, brought it to Prabhupada with a good instruction manual for it, and this gave him the manual saying, Here you can learn how to use it. And Prabhupada said, I don't need that. So he just took it and started it. And the guy was amazed, you know, how could Prabhupada know how to use this thing? He came from India, an elderly gentleman, and here he knows how to use modern technology. So he made this little observation there that Prabhupada seemed to be very at ease with, with electronics and technology, those kind of modern things. Uh, and I would say it's most probably because he saw their usage for Krishna service. And not only that, but he had a good, you know, way of understanding those things, which is quite interesting. So anyway, he had borrowed a tape recorder at that time. This was before the 26 Second Avenue and all that. 
where the whole ISKCON movement started. And uh, he turned on the tape recorder just before he started, you know, speaking to the walls. And uh, I heard, and I hope it's correct, that this recording uh, later became what we now find in the Bhagavad Gita as the introduction, uh, which I think is really wonderful if you think about it, right? You're sitting there speaking to the walls, just faithfully following you, you know, your instruct the instructions of your Guru Maharaj, and then just by that, <laughs> nobody comes and you don't give up anyway. And then that is now what I'm sitting with here. And it's just, you know, I don't know how many copies of this you find all over the world today. Millions and millions of hundreds of millions, I don't know. And uh, so that is the first part of the story. And that's really where, you know, the entire Krishna consciousness movement started way back. And uh, there are really nice uh, stories. I really appreciate, you know, you have older disciples of Prabhupada from those days, of course, you know, we're all older, but uh, who are now just talking about that time. And there are plenty of videos on YouTube. I just found them the other day, a whole bunch of them, uh, really nice. And there were things coming up there which I didn't really know about before, you know, after like 40 years. So thank you very much, all of those devotees who put all these nice um, documents, you could say, historical documents online. Now, skip ahead. Uh, this was probably, as I was not around, uh, neither there <coughs> nor then. Uh, I was... Very, I was a young boy then, I think, uh, living in a small town in Sweden. Let's say we pretend it was something like 66 or something, probably plus minus a year or something like that. And uh, of course, we could get into a whole story. <laughs> it's it's hard to resist actually um, how I first heard the Hare Krishna mantra but we'll take that some other day um, but you know you skip ahead what is it 12 years or something and then you have uh, this guy uh, stepping into the Hare Krishna temple first at Govindas the old Govindas we had here in Stockholm a very nice place, I miss it really. And uh, got an invitation, um, went to New Radakun, stayed there over a weekend, and didn't like anything. <laughs> I didn't take any prasadam because I was on a f microbiotic fast or something. And uh, I didn't chant uh, on Japa because I, I don't know, I was just too proud. Um, I didn't want, you know, they gave me basically a Bhagavad Gita. Um, I don't know, I never paid for it, but I just found one lying on my table. And I don't even know how it get, ended up there because I didn't want to read these books. I read so many books, you know. Seen it all, done it all at age 22. That's called, you know, I don't know what it's called, but. So anyway, uh, then I was basically locked into the guest room for that whole weekend and I was a completely hopeless case, I guess. Um, probably, you know, branded a demon or whatever by the devotees there because, you know, didn't want to get out, even to go to the temple. I was in the temple room for some kirtan and then I just felt this is too much for me. Day after, I... I think it was a day after Monday or something. I was sitting taking lunch in my home and then I found this Bhagavad Gita lying on the table there. Um, so I just kind of, I generally just, you know, took a book and read it you or know, something a little bit, you know, when I was eating. So I took that one and I just, you know, flipped it open and I, I started reading the introduction. 
this one that I am looking at right here. And uh, of course, you know, it starts Om Agyanati Mrandasya Agyananganati Salakaya Chakshuru Militam. So, I mean, with a whole bunch of prayers. Somehow that I made it past those. And then when it started there, Bhagavad Gita is also known as Gita Upanishad, is the essence of it. I just started reading there and after like a few paragraphs, I think I read like half of it or something, I was just completely baffled. And I thought, what is this? This man he speaks, because I, at that time I believed that there is a God. I used to be just, you know, scientific atheist and all of that, but then I had come to that point, you know, I cracked that much open. And I thought, this man here, he speaks as if he knows God personally. And I was like, I never read anything like that. This was, it really took me, you know, something in, in the way he was talking about God, you know, about Krishna and Arjuna as his friend. And I was, and, and, and after reading half of this, I decided I have to join that temple. <laughs> I don't know why, but I mean, I know why really, but it just, how it went so fast. I just couldn't say anything, just nothing to say. So I called them up, I remember, and I asked them, can I, can I join, you know, can I move in there? And there was somebody, I don't know who answered, but he said like, what? You want to move in here? <laughs> and yeah, I think I want to do that. So then, of course, what happened then is another story, but so that Saturday I just took all everything, you know, that I owned and put it in a pickup, rented pickup and just dumped it there in the reception in the New Radakon, and that was it. I'm finding myself in a sleeping bag outside the bathroom of the Barmachari ashram with a little, you know, bag of belongings and bye-bye material world. So, but then I realized after years and years that this introduction was that same that Prabhupada had spoken there in that empty room to those empty walls. So somehow by doing that, you know, he made me a devotee. Something what you could, you know, whatever you want to call me, but someone who tries to be a devotee. But And that you know, you know, the gratitude I feel for this and the wonder, you know, the, the admira admiration of Prabhupada about, you know, having that simple and very pure faith in his, you know, in his Guru Maharaj and the lesson that he, he teaches us by that, that, you know, you may have success or you may have what seems to be failure. You may have, you know, a thousand people um, listening to you when you speak your Bhagavad Gita or whatever, or nobody. But just by doing it, uh, first of all, you speak to yourself too. Uh, then, you know, that is success and you can never really know what's going to happen. And I. I also meditate a bit on this now, because I'm in this video now, I should stop. So stop and also continue now. They are in the second you know, level of when I just go blah, blah, talk, whatever I want. But um, I kind of meditate a little bit on it. Well, this is important for me now also when I you know, start with this, these few fumbling first steps at being a YouTuber. Uh, it's a very fascinating thing because I realize one thing is that YouTube is a very, very different kind of media that were anything we ever uh, experienced before. I, I used to, you know, it was like when I was a temple president in Gothenburg in, in, in 1986, this was, no, sorry, 96, uh, then <laughs> I, I had built a little radio studio in the attic there, 
And I was starting to experiment a little bit with, you know, because we used to make radio on this Swedish new radio where they used the old, you know, transmitter based radio, the ether wave radio. But then I had started trying, you know, to put sounds out over the internet and at that time there was no sound on, on the web. What to speak of pictures, uh, video. Pictures of course there were. There were there. Uh, but I managed to get a little, you know, some radio programs there on, on the web page, Radio Krishna web page. Sounded terrible but it's, you could hear what was said. But then I read about something called ADSL and I, uh, something you know you would have higher bandwidth and I kind of sat down calculating and came up to this realization that one day in a few years we will be able to you know put videos online. So uh, I started you know kind of gradually getting into that all I was never a video guy really. And. Uh, at first I tried to, be, you know, learn how professionals do it, you know, everything should be right and, you know, you, you have this teleprompter, you sit and you speak and you see the text, you know, scrolling by and you just talk like this, like the news readers and everything is just perfect, you don't say anything wrong. And I then, or I, once I produced a, a, a TV, you know, a, a little film, like 15 minutes long, called the real life show. I don't know if anyone, anyone ever looked at it. Uh, and I put it on, I, I was like, I thought, wow, this is cool. You can make such nice things. I tried animation and this and that, and I just mixed up a thing and I had a script and uh, one year it took and nobody looked at it <laughs> when I put it online. And I wonder, you know, nobody's interested in it. One person gave a comment that was Pancharatna Prabhu. Mayapur, I don't know if it's in Alaksha now, but uh, and it was so encouraging just to get that person who had understood the potential of this, <clears throat> how you can use, you know, <clears throat> cinematography and you can use audio and you can use animation and pictures and everything. So, um, but then I kind of uh, drifted into other things for a while, but but now I realized that just by I sat down a couple of days ago just like this in the studio and I just, you know, as I'm doing now, just talking. Whatever comes into my mind, I don't care, you know, I mean. And I got the most viewers I ever got on a video <laughs> on YouTube and I, I, I discussed it with my boys, they're 14 and they know YouTube. And they showed me one guy, maybe you know him, PewDiePie. Felix Schellberg, I think, is from Gothenburg, Sweden. He's the biggest YouTuber in the world. He has like more than 90 million uh, subscriptions. And if you look at this guy, what he's doing, he's, he's, everything is lousy quality and he's just going blah, 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 and doing whatever he likes to do. And his editor is just playing around, messing up everything. But people love him. <laughs> and I was, I wondered what in the world, and I realized it's because he's for real, the guy. So I think that, you know, for me it was. I just need to want to thank everybody that um, that you look, looked at this video two days ago because it gave me some hope that it's actually possible. <laughs> that you know to do these things uh, to, that people could ever be interested in i don't know how far anyone looked at it, but just the fact that 50 people clicked on it, that video is enough for me and uh, so i just want to thank everybody for that uh, although i only shared this within the vaishnavas in sweden site uh, a group on facebook uh, so it means that out of like 300 people, devotees there, 50 clicked on that, which is completely amazing to me. So um, anyway, that I just wanted to say that. Thank you, you gave me a little bit of courage here, quite a lot actually, that it could be possible. And I would just love to, and I think probably many would agree with me, that if others would also uh, show up here, you know, 
it takes a little bit you know of a kicking your false ego you know to stick your face out like this but you know we did it before so why not again and uh, I heard you know a certain CJ uh, Chan was being pushed by his daughter to do the same thing here so I think that a few of us old timers especially we might be waiting for something or is it gonna chicken out so uh, let's see um, anyway thank you very much for uh, looking this far and you know you who make it even through this long last rambling uh, thank you especially uh, and all glorious to Sri Guru Guranga and Hare Krishna